Good afternoon, everyone. So I am Mihai Nostase. I'm a software ninja at Steam Hacks, and I have the pleasure to welcome you all to this Inspire session. Uh, the next person to talk with us is Mike Trevor from Cutter Group. Mike Trevor is the Global Business Development Director at Cutter Group and one of the world's leading suppliers of virtualized computing solutions. Uh, and today he will talk about uh, changing, changing futures with technology. Uh, in his talk, Mike Trevor will share how the Cutter Group has evolved from humble beginnings to become one of the world's leading experts in virtualized IT solutions and how they've been able to innovate technology to transform the operations of many organized uh, organization, including a number of educational establishments. So, Mr. Trevor, you have the audience. Please begin. Thank you. Please call me Mike as well. And I think I always thought I had the coolest job title ever, but uh, being a software ninja, I think, trumps that. So, well done, Mikhail. Um, thanks very thank much you, for, for, for inviting me here today, and thanks everyone for joining. Um, today is just really an opportunity to sort of tell uh, a bit of a story to try and appeal to a number of parties. I know this there's very um, a heavy leaning towards the academic side um, in terms of our attendees today, and thank you all for making it. But I think there's something in here for everybody. Um, so. The things I'd like to just sort of cover today and give you an insight into is the story of us as a business and, and how we have grown from literally nothing um, to becoming now recognised as a leading light in the field of um, virtualized technology solutions. Um, so our journey, how we've got there uh, and the path that it's taken. Um, some of the core technology that forms part of that, particularly around our desktop solutions. Um, and how that journey has evolved as the technologies evolved, but also, and probably most importantly, I think, is this how technologies that we're using have changed people's futures, and particularly how that now impacts in um, you know the post-COVID world, which we're all experiencing, which is forcing change in a number of areas, both in academia and in uh, uh, in private enterprise and public sector as well. So, um, I apologise if. Um, you, all you're going to get to see, I'm not going to murder you with PowerPoint, so you're just going to get to see my, my radio friendly face uh, for 20 minutes or so. Um, so us as a business, we started in 2005, so we've got a track record now, 15 years. The business was started by my brother, um, who was originally was a helicopter pilot in the army, no technology background at all. Um, and I think his wife decided it was time for him to leave the forces and um, and he then had to look at retraining into a different industry. The retrenchment programs that exist um, from the military cover a number of sectors, one of which was IT. He decided that might be an area of interest for him. So as part of that, he got a placement with a business local to him, which was a kind of jack of all trades. So they would do a little bit of networking, bit of desktop, bit of server, bit of email type um, service provision. Um, and he found that he had a, quite a, an aptitude for technology, but there was a particular area of technology that he'd identified and started doing some work with within the education sector um, around the delivery of their desktop computing, um, which he saw a niche for. Um, he took it to his boss and said, look, this is an area I think we need to expand our activities. And his boss said, yeah, you're probably right, but uh, I just can't be bothered. So the opportunity would have fallen by the wayside, but but um, my brother decided that actually this was a good motivator for him to go, do you know what? I really think there's a an opportunity here and a need. Um, and therefore he started the business. Um, so the business was started uh, by him and uh, a former business partner of his who's now retired and going yachting around the world and doing what he's doing. Um, but it started with you know, my brother on his kitchen table, building servers uh, and delivery. Um, it had a footprint initially in the education sector. Our remit has now expanded across multiple sectors, but education at many levels stays at the heart of that, right? From um, university, college and secondary education, primary education doesn't really fit with the kind of technologies that we do. So we still have that as a footprint um, in our business and will remain so. It's a, a, a sector that we understand very well. We understand its needs, its challenges, its requirements, and I think it's always going to be a part of what we do. So as the business sort of grew and the opportunities um, came in, um, the profile of what we were doing, and it started around thin client computing and better ways of delivering um, desktop, um, did start to get a bit of traction both in the industry with the attention of Sun Microsystems that latterly was taken over by Oracle, 
Uh, and also a little bit in the press, they got a, a slot on, you're probably all too young to remember, um, BBC's working lunch slot. There was a profile um, on the business there because of the um, activity and the traction we were getting in the education sector. Um, five years or so after the business started, um, they got to a point where um, growth was something that they wanted to do and to expand and to kind of enterprise grade it from being a, a garden shed type operation without being disrespectful to its origins um, to something more enterprise grade. Um, and uh, my brother approached me um, who doesn't, I don't have a background in technology. I've been around technology a lot. My background was in financial services regulation uh, and I'd worked for some major banks both here and, uh, and abroad as well uh, and financial institutions. So I knew the system side from a procurement and from a governance perspective and being part of uh, a lot of the selection processes of that. So I understood that area of technology. So um, he asked if I'd like to come on board and get involved uh, and help grow the business and expand it further. And I thought, you know what, it's a great opportunity. Uh, and that was 10 years ago and, and the rest, as they say, is history. Our business has now grown organically um, in that 15 year period to such that we are now um, 14 individuals uh, of which the vast majority, uh, I'm the exception and a couple of guys in sort of admin and logistics, everyone else is a technologist, they're rocket scientists, these guys are incredibly clever and that technical excellence has been at the heart of what Cut has done right from the beginning, it's what we've you know, taken great pride in. We've now been able to grow that business from those humble origins of my brother's kitchen table to now turning over over two million pounds um, worldwide. We're working in nearly 30 countries around the globe. Um, and actually, we're also um, a service provider to a number of high profile and also some niche technology vendors. Um, probably the biggest, most well known one that we're a service provider to is Fujitsu, obviously a huge Japanese super corp. Uh, recognises the value of 15 clever guys um, and girls doing stuff with their technology. So the reason we started doing what we do was because we saw an opportunity to do technology better. In the education sector, schools, colleges, universities were being hammered and still are in many circumstances by legacy vendors just wanting to perpetuate the old treadmill um, as it was of PC replacement, just selling the next box that somebody wants them to sell. That idea of just technologists turning up on a doorstep going, oh, this is great. You want to buy one of these? Uh, and it was identified that we felt that we could do better. So our first foray into that and the opportunity my cutter was started was around a better way of delivering desktop computing. And it all started with um, these cracking devices, the Sunray. Um, now obsolete, although we do still have some in production environments because they last so long. And this was a great way of breaking the PC cycle. So instead of having, and I don't want to teach you to suck eggs if you're familiar with thin and zero client technologies, but this basically takes computing away from the desktop and puts it into the data center. And this device is what then provides that experience to the user. It's a picture painter, nothing more. No moving parts, no processing done in that box. And you can see from the size of it, it's obviously a lot more portable, a lot more discreet, doesn't generate um, or indeed consume human, huge amounts of energy, and doesn't produce heat, it's very quiet. So education was a great environment to see these things. It's boot up time incredibly quick. So, you know, education environments, um, not so much in university world, um, but certainly in school environments, you get some smart ass kid who turns off his next door neighbor's PC and then it's going to take you another five minutes to boot up to rejoin the learning environment. So that kind of thing didn't happen with with the Sunray technology. As desktop computing technologies uh, have developed, um, it then formed from that world into the virtual desktop infrastructure environment. So the true VDI of um, a completely configurable desktop based in the data center that then can be accessed by devices, possibly thin client, can be through PC, can be through tablet, through phone. So much, much more capable, although um, environment and infrastructure heavy solution, a way of delivering desktop computing. Our initial relationship was, as I've said, with Oracle and uh, as Oracle Sunray technology became more wide, particularly in education, they also developed the Oracle VDI um, platform as well, which was fiendishly complicated, which worked in our favour that we suddenly became renowned for being the company that really understood it best. And actually, um, way before we'd even got to the size that we are now, 
we uh, as a company had delivered Oracle VDI to more customer sites globally than anyone else, which was amazing. We had a very close relationship with them. They understood the strategic value of us as a technology partner with our expertise, and that allowed us to build that kind of niche position. Um, this led us to working overseas. We always assumed that lots of people could do what we do in this technology, particularly in virtualization on the desktop. But actually, it turns out that, that they couldn't. And we were flown into Oman by Oracle to rescue a project that had gone very badly wrong in uh, a very prominent university in Oman, um, where a local partner had tried to deliver a VDI environment, had made quite a hash of it. Um, and Oracle themselves couldn't bail it out. So they asked us to do it uh, and we managed to get alongside them, get our arm around the customer, we visited their site. We did a mini audit for them and said, look, you know, we know we can fix your problems. Um, will you give us the opportunity to do it? They actually flew some of their um, staff over to the UK to look at some of our reference sites and to talk to our customers and say, look, do these guys know what they're doing? Because they were really on their, their last legs with, with the technology. Uh, and they, they said, OK, we'll give you an opportunity. We managed to fix it. They're still an existing client of ours and we've migrated the technology as that's gone on and expanded it further. But what it showed us was that there was a great opportunity for us with a unique set of skills to take that further. And now we've um, expanded our business throughout the Middle East region, um, right across the whole GCC area, as well as other parts of the world. Uh, and it also led as part of our growth and expansion to setting up an operation based uh, on the island of Cyprus um, to give us a little bit more geographical coverage to what we do uh, and also a fantastic place to hold board meetings when we need to as well. Um, just want to talk a little bit about the way in which we work as a business. As I've said before, we're very focused on our technical expertise. What I found on the receiving end of technology companies coming to talk to us about we've got something that's going to make your life better is everybody tells you what they've got's the best and um, as technology becomes more and more complex it's more and more difficult for customers actually to discern what is right for them and so they really need to look for trusted advisors to help guide them on that journey now, if that trusted advisor has vested interest in particular core technologies, then they're going to be telling them that this technology is the best uh, and people hate being sold to. Um, so we always maintained we wanted to operate our business on a consultative basis. We have no sales force at all. Nobody has a number. Nobody carries a number that says you've got to sell X, whether it be X widgets or whether it be X revenue. Nobody has to do that. Now, the reality, of course, is that every single one of the people in our business is effectively selling because they're promoting us as a business, our expertise with existing and new customers. But nobody's got that sales mentality that you reach the end of the quarter. Ah, I'll just go and sell one of these storage boxes to this customer, whether they need it or not. And that's led us to a position where our credibility in the marketplace and with our customers is second to none. Another interesting one for us as a business is that we don't maintain any office premises anywhere on the planet. We're working right across the EMEA region from Sweden as uh, furthest north at the moment down into Kenya, um, right through um, Europe, loads in the UK still, and as I say, a lot, lot of footprint in the Middle East. Nobody has um, an office to go to. This is my office here, um, built in my garden. Everybody is remote. Um, so I'd love to say that it was done because we knew that there was going to be a global pandemic on the horizon. It wasn't. It was about efficiency. It was about um, managing cost so we don't have to pass real estate cost on to customers. It was about work life balance for people uh, and it was about productivity as well. Having people sat on trains or in cars trying to find somewhere to park to get into an office, which is absolutely prevalent now. It's just not a good use of anybody's time or indeed money. So we've maintained that remote operating model. Um, we maintain the systems around the globe remotely. Um, we do that through strategic partnership with uh, other businesses, which I'll talk a little bit further on. Um, we do put people on site when necessary. In fact, my role in the business is from the strategic side. So establishing partnerships in local territories is my job um, outside of COVID world. I sit on planes, fly around the world shaking hands and drinking tea. So I think I've got the best job. 
Um, but actually, it means our operating model is is much more efficient than you know. You have a problem, you have to wait for somebody to turn up on site to access the servers to to examine the problems and do diagnosis work. We can be there instantly. In fact, most of the time we head it off at the pass because we have constant monitoring on all of the systems we support, and we're supporting extensive numbers of systems, uh, both desktop environments and data centers in, in a variety of countries. Now, because of our, our model uh, and the, our skill set, what we're good at, we're good at designing, delivering and supporting solutions. We're not very good at knocking on doors saying, hey, do you want to talk about VDI? Um, so we fell into a, a, a kind of a natural gravitation to a partner based model. So when we found the, the partner in the Middle East that had um, stuffed up the um, Oracle VDI deployment in Amman, we saw this as an opportunity and put an arm around them and said, look, guys, you don't really have the skills to do this. We can do this on your behalf. You've got all the customers. We've got all the skills. Let's work together to do this, uh, which they thought was a great idea and has led to a very successful relationship. But it also then means we've been able to take that further out into the marketplace to other technology providers in other territories, both the UK and abroad, um, to develop ourselves as a professional services delivery model. Um, now, 80% of our business net new is done through partnerships. We cut them in on the deal, the customer stays theirs, we don't take them off them, we just deliver a professional services offering. So it means that we can give the very, very best cutting edge um, services to a wider variety. It's our cost of distribution, and we found that works really well. In addition to that, um, because of our reputation, our skill set and our successes, we've come to the attention of a number of key vendors who are skill short, um, the largest of which is Fujitsu, as I've mentioned before. And we've been able to develop, while staying vendor agnostic, a very close relationship with Fujitsu, where we are used as a professional services capability by Fujitsu in a number of ways. Um, we are deployed to customer sites and alongside their other partners in the ecosystem to deliver cutting edge solutions in virtualization. Um, but we're also used to support their own internal technical resources in the development of products and services around our skill set. So we're very well integrated with them, but they also know that we're not beholden to them. If Fujitsu technology doesn't, uh, doesn't fit into one of our clients, we will not be using Fujitsu technology and they know that. And we have a very healthy adult relationship on that basis because of a mutual respect we have between them. Um, I'm delighted to say, and I know in um, and so his previous session, she was uh, saying about some fantastic um, winners um, and prize winners in, in the session there. Uh, we, for the second time and the first time any company's done it, were winners of the Fujitsu Global Innovation Award on Thursday um, for a project which I, I'll talk a little bit about a bit further on in our session. So um, we have a great relationship with them. We've been very successful, but they've still got to step up to the plate and make sure their technology works in the environments in which we're talking. So from the technologies that we've, um, thank you very much. Uh, so um, from the technologies been working with, as I say, we started in thin client world, great opportunity to take computing away from the desktop, just with a device for access. Um, fantastic technology, you can see in the top there, it's got a little slot port. So session portability, you could be typing an email on one session, take the card out, move to a different office, a different classroom, for example, put it into another Sunray device and immediately resume the session halfway through the email that you were in. So that kind of session portability, as well as some of the other advantages I've mentioned, were, were absolutely crucial in the early days of making desktop computing revolutionary. Um, it's, it's important to remember that when doing desktop computing, in the way in which we're talking about, why, whether with thin client or with um, full virtualized environments, it's nothing to do with the desktop itself. It's a data center project, and you have to understand what goes on in the data center and how that integrates into the wider IT environment to make those work. So as the technology in VDI progressed, we moved down that route as a natural extension to the work that we'd been doing. Um, and it can be very, very complex to get it right. Um, people approach it from the, the wrong um, angle. They approach it as a desktop project. Um, they don't take into account the user experience. They're not prepared to make compromises. They don't understand scaling. They don't understand impact to workload. And that can create some really significant and costly mistakes in the development of this, which is why we developed our partner model so that we can do that specialist bit and supplement other, other companies trying to provide these solutions, but not having to fall back onto their own engineering skills. Um, the rewards of VDI can be big. 
Um, it offers huge capability if used properly in terms of remote access capability, bring your own device, mobility based solutions, having people working in different offices, being on the road all the time, the kind of technologies we're now seeing becoming more and more important as we face the challenges that the COVID brings. Our skill set then evolved. Many, many of our customers were asking us to get more and more involved in their data center on non desktop based work because of our trusted advisor status. And so expanded our capabilities further into the areas of data center virtualization, basically all software defined data center work that falls within our remit. Now, I know we're talking heavily about desktop and the way it's it's making mobility work, but it's made us expand our capabilities, but always staying at the top of our game and making sure that if we're going to do something, we do it better than everybody else. Um, obviously, as that technology is developed, um, cloud came along. Now, cloud has obviously existed for um, many, many years, but never had the catchy marketing tagline of being cloud. And what was amazing is so many customers talking to us and our peers about, oh, we, we need to, to be in the cloud. We need a cloud strategy without having the faintest idea what cloud is and how it works. Um, now, my personal belief and I believe as a business is the cloud does have a place to play in the technology computing world, but it's not the panacea of all ills. Um, there was a, a, a mass stampede to the cloud recently over the past five years, I say, um, where everybody wanted everything in the cloud, get rid of their own data center, put everything in the cloud. And they suddenly realized that actually cloud is just somebody else's data center, it's somebody else's computer. And the control that gets lost as part of that and impacts on functionality and performance uh, are, are then sort of writ large. So we've seen a number of those clients who went charging off into the cloud coming back or at least hybridizing their environment. But it does present some real opportunity, but it does also come with risk. In the recent COVID pandemic, one of our customers who is classed as a blue light service as they're a supplier to blue light services, actually um, lost some of their cloud desktop computing capability because AWS, Amazon uh, Web Services, ran out of capacity in their areas and took them away to be given to other customers. So as a blue light service, they were then inhibited in the provision of the desktops because of the cloud structure that they had. Um, and, um, you know, so cloud is not infinite, as despite what everybody will tell you in the marketing blurb, it does come with some significant risks, but it does form a part of the solutions that we're looking at going forward. So with the technology that we've got in our kit bag and the small section of it we've looked at about computing and accessing your desktop anywhere, um, we're obviously all now facing lots of challenges in COVID terms whether that means the delivery uh, and receipt engagement of education or whether that's in um, wanting to run a commercial business um, under conditions where you can't be in the same room, you can't be in office space, you might having to be uh, be having to isolate, etc. So COVID has put a lot of challenges up which did exist for different reasons before, but has now have now been accelerated by the requirement to have greater flexibility in the delivery of computing. Um, I just want to talk through a few examples of where we've used our technologies and capabilities to make real change. Now, I mentioned the, the award we won uh, on Thursday with Fujitsu was for a specific project um, for a customer of ours called New College Worcester. Now, New College Worcester is a boarding school um, for blind and visually impaired students. So their educational needs are quite specific and quite advanced and the technology that needs to underpin that is, is crucial for them receiving any kind of education. Uh, what we did there was to redesign their data centre to give them a much more sustainable um, uh, platform for them to build their special educational software needs from, but also we opened that up to remote um, learning capability because obviously being a boarding school, not everybody boards there, but access is a problem uh, in COVID times for them. So they needed still to provide access to both staff and pupils to continue that learning journey, which they've been able to do. So they've seen no interruption due to COVID around the technology stack. So that was a, a, a nice project um, that we were able to do to, to affect real outcomes for people. Um, uh, a larger, still education focused scenario is another example of ours, which is for Fife College in Scotland. 
Now, Fife had started down a journey with us of creating virtual environments. They wanted to um, reduce their own desktop estate. Um, they also wanted to reduce their data center footprint as well. So they'd started on the journey for virtualization with full VDI. Um, but also, again, of course, with COVID coming in, they've immediately had to replan the delivery of their education. Uh, and therefore it's accelerated and also transformed in a number of areas. Now, this was an interesting one from a technologist's point of view, that it's not just a VDI solution, but we're also deploying, um, I'm just trying to think of the size of it now, so I think it's 500 VDI desktops, which are accessible for both staff and students. Um, but also we've uh, implemented 135 desktops worth of um, computing via Moonshot chassis from HPE. Now, these provide a higher capability, higher density desktop experience, and they're used for very specific um, faculties in their computing. Uh, they have a large proportion there in software development and games development, so they need a different kind of experience on the desktop. So they've wanted uh, access to a different capability, which we've delivered through, through Moonshot. So they have a very blended but fully flexible um, desktop estate now of over 600 desktops, which can be accessed absolutely anywhere. Now, I mentioned before about bring your own device. Um, they don't use a bring your own device environment. They've issued Chromebooks to all students and staff as part of their, their education engagement, but it could just as easily be um, accessed through a bring your own device environment and completely divorcing it from, uh, from being managed locally. Um, the flexibility of access that it gives them and the remote learning capability has enabled them to continue under these circumstances. Um, just going to give you just a couple more slightly different insights. Um, again, sticking in education, um, a project we did, which was our, our first winner of the Fujitsu Global Innovation Award, was very much data center focused, but it's about facilitating and making how, uh, you know, being a great example of how technology can change people's lives. And this was a project with the Oxford Partnership in Saudi Arabia. Now, this is a partnership um, set up to provide education to um, women in rural parts of Saudi um, through obviously social and political challenges in Saudi Arabia. Saudi Arabia, female education is, uh, is a difficult one to deliver um, and particularly into rural areas where the challenges literally of data centers being knocked out by power cuts or sandstorms and this kind of thing was a reality. So what we did with TOP was to um, develop a, um, a remote hub activity for the three colleges spun outside of the main data center, which was set up in Medina, which means that they're not reliant on having local access to um, support and technologists to provide the environments. They have a core team in Medina that we then support that data center there and also then the remote hubs that are based at each of those colleges. And again, I'm not a technologist, so, you know, the, the racks and the data center servers and all that stuff is of zero interest to me. What interests me is how access via that technology has created opportunities for these women and girls to get an education that they wouldn't have been able to access and also the next progression of that as they're setting up um, business centers to take them from education and to make them workplace ready as well so that's something we'll be supporting top with um, going forward um, taking it back more into the commercial sector for the last example uh, i can't name them but a major uk energy company uh, that we've been working with wanted to move into the cloud. They wanted to move um, into a public hyperscaler. They had a very aging data center they didn't want to support anymore. They wanted to reduce their real estate costs. And again, the project started initially pre-COVID, but very quickly um, expanded to a, a, an accelerated program to facilitate them continuing to be effective in delivery of their services. So this is a, a 30 site operation. So it's a very disparate solution in terms of where they need their desktops delivered. And it's about a thousand desktops in the environment, just over a thousand desktops that need to be delivered. Um, of course, a lot of this is facilitated by changing operating model required. Um, remote working, people working from home, um, office shares, reduced office capability, and they needed that greater flexibility. So we've been able to do that with, um, with Citrix and Azure for them. Um, and it just means that they can sort of stay ready uh, and able to meet these COVID challenges. Uh, and I think COVID for me, uh, and I, th I think it has for uh, economic models more than technology models in some ways that 
COVID is accelerating the change that was already in place. Um, and we've never been busier, which is, is great. Um, and we can certainly see that this kind of technology facilitating change in business models uh, and, and learning environments is certainly going to continue. But just to finish off in summary about sort of us and our technologies, that what we've enjoyed and how we've been successful, I think, is um, because we're swimming in blue water. Now, what I mean by that is, and this was explained to me by a very clever Australian chap once, that you can have red water and you can have blue water in the ocean. The red water is where everybody's fighting. It's the shark pit where everybody's rending each other and there's blood everywhere. It's a very difficult place to become successful. Um, whereas if you're swimming in blue water, there's no other sharks there trying to tear you apart. And because we've been able to develop a unique skill set with a unique delivery model, we are now um, and actually always have been swimming in blue water um, comes with slightly different challenges but you're not just churning out the same old stuff um, have a passion for what you do um, both in terms of the technology the guys our engineering and architectural teams are absolutely passionate about these technologies but we are all passionate about the outcomes it's not about the the bells and the whistles and the flashing lights this is about how technology can change outcomes for people, how it can improve things like work-life balance, educational opportunities, employment opportunities, profitability opportunities, making life a better place is, is what this is about. Um, I think we've been successful because we care what we do. Um, having customers that trust us um, has been earned by the fact that we're investing in them. They're our number one, they pay our bills, they enable us to pay our mortgages and feed kids and animals and all of these things. So they're absolutely important. But also, I would say that looking after your own staff is, is sometimes more important. If you have a happy delivery team, then you're going to have happy customers. It's a natural consequence. So sort of caring about what you do, both internally and externally, is important. Um, I think we've been creative in what we've done and how we've done it. Uh, and this has created this kind of blue water environment, which has made us successful. Um, but I think the, the one overriding thing I would say about our business and how we've been able to achieve success is that we have fun in, in doing it um, and we have fun working with the people we do, both technology, uh, our customers uh, and just with each other as well. So if you don't have fun in what you do, I think you need to change what you're doing and go and do something better. Um, if anybody's got any questions, I'd be more than happy to field them. Um, and thank you very much for staying awake, those that have, and pretending to be there if you haven't. <laughs> um, um, actually, actually, I don't know if there's anyone else who has a question. Um, obviously, I'm not one for the tech-related stuff. Um, but I would actually like to ask you, uh, because personally, I don't know anyone, anyone else who was already working uh, on a remote work model before the COVID. So has, has this model caused any difficulties in your operations? Um, it, that's a brilliant question, Zoe, thank you. Um, for us, it hasn't um, simply because the business has always been modelled on this. Now, the challenges that that throws up is that actually we need to make sure and we've always had to make sure that we're recruiting people that can adapt um, to this environment. Very few people that we've taken in have been in a remote working environment before. They may have done it once or twice or a little bit, maybe one day a week. But actually getting the right kind of people with the right mindset is, is very important. And everybody thinks about when you talk about the remote operating model, it's about, oh, how can you trust people to do it? And that, that's really not the way to think about it. So for, for us, it hasn't been a massive transition, but it has made us look very carefully about our recruitment strategy. There's a real risk of people becoming isolated, leading to you know depression, dissatisfaction, lack of productivity, all kinds of challenges that come with being isolated from that opportunity to, you know, be in an office, see people face to face, that human interaction, the what we like to call the water cooler moment where you can talk about what was on television last night, the latest movies, gadgets, whatever, in that kind of face to face. So we, we've put in things that, that facilitate that. So we have um, varying chat rooms um, using Slack and, and others for specifically engineering things where they can share information on tickets and more collaborative working type activities. But we also make sure that we are checking in with people from a management basis, not are you doing it, it's the are you okay 
is there anything we can do to help? We're very flexible with our people and their time. We give them the chance to go and do things that are different. We encourage people to take breaks away from the desk. It's very easy, particularly for technologists, to just be sat in front of screens all the time. It's their natural habitat. They like it as long as somebody slides pizza under the door, they're happy. But actually they need better care than that. Being out, being physical, change the environment. Personally, because I'm based at home, um, I like to change my environment. Um, very often I'll go and work in a coffee shop. I'm going to do my, my shopping in town, but I'll spend an hour working in a coffee shop just to see other people be in a different environment rather than the same four walls. And I think that helps. Um, what I do think, though, you're right, Zoe, is that there are massive challenges for businesses or, or organisations that are now trying to migrate to that model or have been forced into that model, that their entire management structure, their expectation on performance is very, very much geared to the office environment. You can see what people are doing. You can see they're there. Of course, the reality is that we know and so many studies have come out that people sat at desks in offices aren't necessarily the most productive. So I think people are now looking at more output based management of productivity so rather than are they sat there working for eight hours a day it's are they producing what i'm expecting them to do um, uh, and i think um, having to change their management structures to make sure that they are supporting their people that they're providing the right technology and facilities obviously we're, we're a part of that delivery mechanism it is what the challenges are now Looking at education again, I think that's an even tougher one to transition to um, to the remote learning environment. Um, we've all sat through lectures and classes and nodded off because the room's a bit too warm and the late nights the night before. But everybody gets sick of Zoom. Everybody gets sick of Teams meetings. So planning and structuring in the educational environment for those kind of deliveries, I think, is fundamental. And of course, the technology that needs to go alongside that to provide it is key. But I, I do think it's pushing organisations to think very differently about what um, not having people physically with you, either in a working or a learning environment is doing. Uh, and they're having to remodel their, their thought processes as much as their businesses or organisations. Thank you. Thank you. Um, anyone else? Uh, another question? OK, works for me because I do have another question. <laughs> um, so uh, I wanted to ask you because I know that you're also involved in the um, uh, you're leading actually the recruitment uh, in, in the company, right? So um, we've invited you before to be part of Innovation Fest and um, assess, um, assess final year projects yeah. um, as an expert in your field. So um, I wanted to ask since since you um, you're the, the best person to tell us about what what a company um, of your caliber would look for in graduates. Definitely. Uh, it's an, another great question, Zoe. Thank you. Um, we have a challenge in recruitment um, and that's multifaceted. One of them is what I alluded to with the remote working model. People are used to being in offices are in kind of um, behavior patterns um, and knowledge patterns um, that are very difficult to break and we work very differently and we innovate very differently with our solutions so actually education is a, a prime hunting ground for us for talent and for opportunities to bring people in um, people who haven't spent 10 years in the technology sector building up all the bad habits that we try and break down is great but also i think one of the things that that's most crucial to us in recruiting and we do recruit from experience but not always is having that passion and drive for the technology and the outcomes as i said at this kind of summary i think it's what's made us successful as a business and what's made us successful as a business is the people that we have in it so for us i think identifying raw talent is great now i don't want to demean at all academic achievements they are important there's some great courses out there which give fantastic um foundation but also more advanced academic um uh, approaches and I think the practicalities of solutions you know some of the final year projects we looked at earlier this year um, particularly in our field the two um, candidates that we saw the two um, graduates they've done some excellent work and it was really heartening to see and we were delighted with that and what we we would look for is somebody who's got that 
that next level okay i understand the technology now what can i do with it and do i have a passion to continue to push and to learn and to deliver outcomes with it rather than resting on the laurels of i understand how the gadgets work great lots of people understand how the gadgets work how can you make those gadgets improve an environment make it work are you prepared to stay up with the tech journey so i think for us it's, it's attitude um it's potential because Academia gives a, fan, a fantastic depth of learning, taking that depth of learning you get from academia and then learning further in um, in industry is the next evolution from that and a passion to continue to develop and learn and push and question, I think, is, is what we look at. So to answer your question, a very short answer, Zoe, is um, attitude uh, and passion, I think, are what we look at and raw talent. Hmm. Excellent. Um, right. Thank you, Mike. Um, I don't know if anyone else um, has any questions. Um, I like uh, I like those three things. Attitude. Uh, my, yeah, I think I grew up being reminded attitude is one of the most critical things that you will ever get to 100 percent. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I also I also appreciate uh, you said attitude, raw talent, and the third, the middle one was. Uh, that's a great one. Um, so I think that that raw talent was was really fascinating, where you've got the word raw in it, and and how you appreciate academia. Yeah. Uh, we we're not expecting as an employer, Rehan, to for academia to present us with a finished article. Yeah. And as I say, actually, that, that's not what we want, because usually the article gets finished in industry and isn't finished in the way that we as a business will want it. So what you create with that raw talent, that solid foundation combined with great attitude, we can we can work with that. We can mold, we can develop. Um, it's taking that and creating in our own image. And, and the further we've gone in our journey um, as a business, 15 years now, um feels longer sometimes shorter on others but what i think we've worked out is actually having raw material to work with in terms of our people is far more rewarding for us far more effective for us and therefore far better for our customers um because it means that we can create along our image um it may sound a little arrogant to say, oh, we, we don't want other people's legacy problems, but actually we do have a very specific way of doing things. And we do have a very particular requirement about our working environment and the attitude that we want. I know that if we cut any of our engineers or architects in half, we would see them like a stick of Brighton rock. They'd have cutter written through them because they buy into what we do. Okay. We, we then buy into them as well. Mm -hmm. um, it's a mutual respect thing. They've invested their time, effort, energies in us. We're going to do the same for them. It's about that flexibility. Treat them as adults. Help them grow. Um, we don't have defined career paths here because we want people to, to grow and to gravitate to technologies, to particular things that interests them. This is the when somebody joins Cutter, we want it to be the last job they will ever have not because we kill them after three years and get some new ones. It's because we can grow as a business with them and they can grow in our environment. They'll never be bored. Technology always moves. We will know this. But actually, the opportunities that we can give them will continue to grow. So if they have a particular interest in networking, they have a particular interest in thin client desktop device computing we can develop that if they just want to be architects we can help them with that and we're never going to be short of opportunities to throw them into because every single customer is different every single environment presents new challenges whilst having a commonality of things that we've seen before they're never alone collaborative working within our team is important so for me Rehan I think um, the raw talent that you produce is exactly what we need but we as an industry can't rest on our laurels and just expect you to produce raw talent either we've got to be involved and this is part of you know today and we're delighted and grateful to you that we want to help you develop the raw talent that we need um, and the more we can do the more exposure we can give to people through through projects through mentoring through all of these kind of interactions can only be good for the people in your environment and that means 
they're getting more out of it, which means we, not just us as a business, but our peers and throughout the industry are going to be getting better quality people to choose from. Yeah, and, and it's absolutely, uh, what is it? it? It's appreciate the fact that, you know, you, you want to engage with uh, education uh, to work with the, ne- with the youth and the next generation to actually evolve them and develop them. But I think the gold dust in me, what I'm hearing here is, uh, I think the raw talent, attitude, passion, uh, but you know, guiding them, the, guiding them the way through works equally two ways. Uh, it takes two to tango, as they say, right? And and uh, dancing your way through the industry, through the complexities of projects, that it, it, it's not just about the company or or the management of the company, but it's equally the tech uh, wanting to understand the deep problems of the company and grow that grow that company is is absolutely fascinating. And I think. From the raw talent perspective, where we are all technologists and we we love to code and we we want to sit down and just leap, hide behind the screens, typical computer scientist, uh, is to is to open up and say, you know what, let's let's understand the business needs and the business wants. I totally get that. You you hit that absolutely on the head, Rohan. When we talk about VDI, which I alluded to, as you know, if nobody's had uh, any experience of it, they are very very complex projects, but. of the problems of a VDI project are the technology and the challenges that come with it. 70% is customer management and expectation management uh, and fulfilling that project's place in a wider environment. It's not about the the bells and whistles and, you know, bites and bits. It's nothing to do with it or very little to do with that. And those kind of skills are very difficult to develop outside of experience and how do you get experience well you need exposure and that exposure comes from industry you have real live bitey clients who are going to get annoyed with you and have high expectations that need to be managed Uh, and that's where we can get involved with education and expose your people to this give them a flavor for it and to help them understand what those challenges are to help them navigate them to help them come up with answers that we might not have thought about Mm -hmm. in challenges that, that are either technological or wider project related. You know, we don't have a monopoly on um, on what makes success in technology. We've got a bloody good track record, but it, we've still got lots to learn ourselves. Yeah. And, and you don't need to be a uh, long in the tooth technologist to teach us. You can be a bright eyed, bushy tailed, somebody with a, the right attitude and passion. We, we can learn from that as well. Uh, and always seeing an opportunity to learn and grow and innovate is I think that's what sort of um, we want. We've espoused that in our corporate culture, and that's why we'd like to encourage that in academia, because then that means we're seeing people looking at you know innovation and outcomes and you know customer centric view of technology. Not they like a particular technology and they want to sell that to as many people as they can. Yeah, you can do that, and there are lots of businesses out there that have that have made you know livings doing that. We could make more money as a business if we were more um excuse the expression but hard asked about the way in which we do it we yeah. could we could really make more money but that's not what we do we we're very commercial and we're very successful but we want to make sure that people are getting proper value from our solutions that we're with them for the journey we're not just leaving them in the lurch that we're continuing to drive forward innovation and opportunity that's going to improve their world whether they be school for for blind kids in Worcester or whether they be you know uh, uh, well we do a lot of government work elsewhere around the world you know whether it be a a government department somewhere in GCC that have very different priorities to the blind school the the attitude is the same they must get value from their engagement with us they they need to have that experience as a good one both from a technological and from a softer skill side oh, interesting. so uh, a very quick uh, question for me is uh, are you recruiting graduates on a, on a regular basis? Uh, not on a regular basis because our growth is organic, but yes, we do. Um, and um, we are always open. What we like to do with our recruitment, because, you know, we could go and recruit 10 people tomorrow um, and hope that the business then supports them. If the business doesn't support them, then we're throwing 10 or five people back into the pond. That's messing with people's lives. Mm-hmm. Um, that's not what we do. We take our, whilst we're really innovative and creative in our solutions, we're very conservative in the way in which we run our business. Security, 
for the reason I said, people are buying into us. We don't want them to, to be thrown back onto the job heap. We don't want them to want to go to another company to try and improve and further their careers. So we are circumspect in the way in which we grow, but we do grow. We probably, we're, we're recruiting, I would say on average, about one, maybe two a year at the moment. Um, so there is opportunity. Uh, and, and BCU is definitely a place that we would be looking to engage to talk about, okay, who's on the radar? And what we do is we create a radar of people we know, uh, people we're aware of, um, who, and some we say, go and go and find your feet somewhere else first, go and learn a few things, and then we'll talk again. Um, other people we go, actually, yeah, you've got the raw knowledge and talent and attitude we need now, and we can bring them into that environment. Really interestingly, we're just looking at um, a kind of uh, an internship for somebody at the moment. So they're the first year of their college course, so they're 16. Um, it's the son of a, a very, very clever technologist that we've known, not in our business, in, in another business, um, who feels his college is letting him down and he's not getting the exposure to the kind of stuff they do. COVID has meant that he's got way too much time on his hands and they're encouraging people on this computer course to go and get work experience. So his father's approached us. We're happy to facilitate. I've met with a guy before. He's very bright. He's got the kind of raw talent. Is he the kind of guy we'd recruit tomorrow? No, he needs to get more miles under his belt. Is he somebody we can give some exposure to the challenges of real world and the technologies? Yes. So we are doing our bit to help kind of develop that. The, the people that you produce, yeah, much more of the kind of finished raw article talent that we would be looking for. And certainly, I think um, coming out of education is our first port of call now for recruitment going forward. So um, we'll keep you busy with opportunities in our own small way. <laughs> We're here, here to service you uh, and, 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 and work with you and ensure. And, and I think the attitude we have in, in our school uh, we're very much industry focused uh, and we have when we build a strong we, we, well we attempt to continue to build a strong relationship with partners like yourselves and uh, even even the big vendors that you, that we partner with yeah but I think uh, what has been critical is to ensuring that you know our, our courses our activities uh, are very innovative are very aligned to the work uh, that your expectations ultimately yeah uh, and then evolving them so I think uh, today's is, is a perfect example to demonstrate that where uh, where we're doing that but we actually begin to embed this into curriculum and that's where uh, a lot of uh, a lot of our work is involved but also uh, with the getting those extra miles under the belt you know getting the becoming a frequent flyer mm. is what we've been working on over the last year so you heard from the previous talk with uh, uh, with uh, <laughs> with a bunch of flatteries around around the software house <laughs> but uh, I think it was it's we're creating opportunities where you know we're working on live projects where we yeah. we're getting involved with uh, uh, with projects that research as well as you know SMEs that need that aid and that support. Uh, so it's it's a it's a it's a it's a parallel journey. Academic mm -hmm. talent being developed, really enforced knowledge. Uh, ground grounding basically and then ultimately you've got this practical experience being evolved uh, on their journey as, as, they come, as, they, as they come out to more fully fledged uh, meeting expectations of, of companies like yours. Yeah and I, and I think sort of developing that kind of interaction uh, there are lots and lots of opportunities to do that. Interesting I just see on the chat there that uh, uh, Lubner has mentioned uh, or asked if if I do mentoring and, and actually mentoring is something that we internally have talked about at Qatar and that we feel that we should do because we feel we've got something to contribute there. So if that's something that, that you want to explore, then then, yeah, by all means, please um, Lubner, if that's of interest to you, then let's discuss it. Definitely. Um, I, I think I think we've got a lot to share, but we've got a lot to get out of that relationship as well. Um, both in terms of potential candidates is the obvious one for us, but also I think in 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 learning and understanding innovation in education, mm -hmm. because everybody looks at things in a very different way. Um, and as broad minded as we like to be in the way in which we approach technological challenges, um, somebody might look at it in a very different way and come up with a very different answer, which we may never have got to. Uh, and so that kind of share we do 
we do talk a lot with our peers in industry. Um, we're very open about it, particularly as we we have our strategic partnership. So we we have working relationships. It's not we don't work in a bubble. Mm-hmm. Um, so we we very often work with uh, our, our peers, theoretically competitors, but because of the way we work, we're we're sort of non-threatening in that. And obviously our, our relationships with with some of the big vendors as well who rely on us means that we get to have conversations which are very stimulating in terms of innovation and application of these kind of technologies. Um, so exploring that through your environment with BCU, I think would be a massive opportunity for us. And I hope that, that it would be something that we can we can contribute in our own small way to, to your world and sort of add a little bit of uh, a little bit of spice on the top of that dish for you. Yeah, we're looking forward to that. Uh, and, and, I, and, and I haven't had a chance, maybe I probably did earlier, but uh, thank you for coming in and mentoring some of the uh, some of the uh, innovation innovation fest work that we did earlier in the year. But ultimately, that journey begins now. So a lot of student projects kick off now. So we will get in touch with you and and align some of the projects that you can engage with some mentoring to as well. By all means, uh, we're we're here to help. We're here to contribute. We're not expecting a free lunch as an industry. We need to put back into education to make sure that we get what we need out of it. Uh, and actually, it's, it's a pleasure to do it because it's fun. Uh, you know, whatever industry you work in, I know, as you alluded to, you and I probably have the same view that technologists can be too fond of the technology sometimes. But one thing I've learned having been in two significant industries is that whatever industry you're in, people by people yes. and kind of attitude and trust um, has to be fostered. You can't buy it and you certainly can't take it for granted. So um definitely i would say you know focus on building relationships whatever you do absolutely that'll be that'll be that's what let's uh and, and ultimately i think people is a it's a, it's a it's a great piece to work with and, and evolving that continually mm. uh, and in the climate now i think more more important than ever uh, yeah. recognize that absolutely um the the biggest danger we have whatever we're doing in our lives today is to become isolated, whether that be socially, professionally, academically, um, don't become isolated. This is one piece of advice I I would give to everybody. Uh, And we can connect in so many different ways, in in so many different um, guises, never miss the opportunity to do that. You never know what happens from a conversation. You never know what happens listening to a story. It could spark uh, an inspiration, an interest, a new way of working. It can change your life, you never know. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I'm just where you on time now. Uh, Zoe, was there anything else? Uh, anybody else had questions? So contact. I'm just picking up uh, Lubna. Yeah, yeah. So uh, if you talk to Zoe, Zoe knows how to reach out to Mike. Yeah. Uh, and then connect you with uh, with uh, with Mike and and, and sure. follow up. Uh, go good. Any? I think it was any other questions for Mike or want to add on like who built my office or things like that i i I like it actually it's quite cool it's very good it's very very actually it's the best investment i've ever made because i was working in my house but actually that idea of that remote working having a bit of separation between work and home is great um but it's set in the garden so my commute to work is 20 seconds it's it's great and you know, you can open the doors, listen to the birds singing and still delivering technology all over the world. It's great. Absolutely. Yeah, I can. Uh, there has been uh, uh, Professor Hanifa is there. You know, there's a silver lining. Uh, in, uh, it's been tough, but there has been some silver linings that we've received. And it's uh, when you reflect on them, they're absolutely appreciated. <laughs> Uh, totally, like, and thank you and if, uh, for reflecting that. I, I just think it's a really, really important thing. Um, just, you know, don't lose connections. Uh, it's a brilliant question. Uh, just come in there. Um, mentally healthy while working remotely, are kind of things I alluded to. Um, don't be isolated. Communicate. I know we can't always necessarily see, sorry to cut you off there, Rehan, but... Uh, uh, we can't always see people in person, but we can communicate. We've got more methods of communication in this day and age than than we've ever had before in life. Use them, um, but don't just do it by text. That's the thing. And I know maybe it's a generational thing with me, but I really appreciate a phone call um, just to, to talk or a video conference where you can see people is great. 
text message exchanges are great and can help you stay connected, but also just listening to the sound of somebody's voice uh, can be great as well. Um, as one thing I would say is keep communicating. Um, the other thing I would say is um, stay physical as well. Our physical health has a direct impact on our mental health. Uh, a lot of the, the people in our business, they have dogs, so they go out walking their dogs and we make sure they do that. Gym visits, just walking, cycling, all of these kind of things. Um, these are important things to, to stay mentally healthy when, when you have these challenges. And I think the other thing from a perhaps a slightly more Zen philosophical point of view is don't forget that what's happening now is not permanent. Um, I can't predict when any of these things will change or improve, but they will change and improve. There is a light at the end of the tunnel. Um, this is but a moment in all of our histories, let alone the history of the wider world. Um, and as tough as they are, and very, very dark, and, and some people are having some terrible experiences at the moment, it is not permanent. Um, and there, there is always hope out there, so never never lose that. Absolutely, and, and I think sometimes when I think about the experiences and, and some of the challenges that uh, health organizations have faced uh, in, in, the, in recent time. Uh, we take it for granted because I've been talking to some of the some of the teams that run the technology behind this uh, and we have a session later on this afternoon at three o'clock which uh, which will which will give you some insights of you know some of the technology teams that run some of these major scale up projects uh, that that support such a such an uh, amazing infrastructure like the NHS. So it's going to yeah. be interesting to hear those conversations too. Yeah, uh, so was there anything else? Uh, who's wrapping up? I can't remember. <laughs> <laughs> it's not me. I'm going to say it, Zoe. Discussion with Mike all all day long. By the way, guys. <laughs> uh, totally, Hanif, I agree uh, with tech people about how. To, how the tech can help people, yeah. It's, it's outcomes, outcomes. There's some amazing tech. Invest in it, learn how it works, do really exciting things, count the number of lights on the front of these boxes, because yeah, it's amazing, but the most important thing is what they do for us and what they do for us as a society. So yeah, let's, I, I tell all my engineers this all the time and they just laugh at me and go back to playing with their tech, but. Super, I, I mean, I really, uh, thank you for uh, coming today. Uh, Trevor, do stay with us. Um, Let's follow up. Let's uh, let's Definitely. let's have some conversations around uh, how how we engage, how we partner, uh, and other opportunities that we can bring to the next generation. I look forward uh, to that much, and thank you very much for including me in in today and the other work that we've done together. It's been a real privilege. Yeah, it's been really uh, really insightful to hear what Clutter. Uh, to be honest, until uh, uh, Zoe introduced yourself uh, uh, to the university, I hadn't heard of Clutter. Uh, With power behind the throne, Rehan, this is the thing. Is. You always hear about the other guys. It's all the yeah. other guys. We do the work behind the scenes. We're not glory hunters. No, I can see that. Uh, and it's, it's, it's fascinating to the, the scale and, and the reach uh, of the organization. And it's absolutely, uh, I'm sure it must be rewarding in the work you do and, and seeing the end outcomes. Massive. Uh, but, but that level of work is, uh, must there must be adrenaline behind it. And I can. I can uh, it's a rush, definitely. <laughs> I, can, I can see that and, and uh, uh, hats off. Well done. Congratulations on, on, on scaling that 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 level. Thank you Thank you, Hanifa. Our pleasure. We're really looking forward to working with you going forward. Super. Uh, we can wrap. Zoe, who's wrapping next? Um, I don't mind. Um, so, Mike, thank you so much for taking the time to be with us today. Um, again, looking forward to more things to come in the future. Uh, thanks, everyone, uh, and uh, have a good afternoon. Thanks very much, everyone. Really appreciate it. Bye-bye. <laughs> thank you. Take care. Bye.